Hi everyone, I'm really excited for this video. I wanted to do it for a long time and the topic is love. How to sense love, what's holding you back, how to attract miracles, how to shift perception. All of this information is something that I really wanted to gather inside of a video. Honestly, also for myself to re-listen to all this material. Most of this information is taken from the book A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. I highly recommend it. I just felt like I wanted to summarize it and divide it into a topic so it would be easier for me to remember it. I hope you will enjoy it too. It's my mini Bible in the subject of love. I just It's 300 pages and I just took it to seven main topics, seven principles that really break down what is love and how to invite it into your life. So the seven topics are one, how to sense love. Two, what's holding you back? Three, why relaxing is a key to love? Four, how to shift perception. This is a really, really important one. We'll get to it when we get to it. Five, how to honestly communicate with each other. Communication is key. Six, how to be an attractor for miracles in your life. And seven, how to become a teacher of love. That's also very interesting. Even though you might not be a healer or a teacher, being a teacher of love is something completely different. So I also put in the description box timestamps if one of those topics interests you more and you just want to jump into it because this is a kind of longer video, I guess. So feel free to jump right into it. Okay, so let's start with the first topic, how to sense love. Let's first state that love is an energy and it is felt through the third eye. So it's a feeling you get when you're around a person, when you get into a room, when you're doing something. It's something that's non-verbal or, you know, you can't really see it, you can only sense it. It's not something that money can buy and physical touch does not guarantee it and we all know that sometimes we just don't feel the love when we're touched. So it has something to do with an energy, an energy that is created as a response to something. So it's something that's coming in you as a response to something you see from the external world. And the, the great thing about it is that it can be projected. So you can project love to someone. Now, the best way to understand the importance of love is to see it as a fuel for our spiritual internal well-being. Like oxygen is vital for our organs to work, for our whole body to function properly. Love is that way for our eternal, emotional, spiritual well-being. That's why when we fight or when we kind of like don't feel the love anymore, we act like somebody cut our oxygen and we can't breathe. It's that important. So basically relationships are a way to create love. That's why relationships exist, to create the love between us. Now, you can also love objects. I mean, you can love a car, you can love, I don't know, uh, clothes, your job, uh, prestige, um, power, but these are things that can't love you back. So the energy of love is only from you to the object, but it's not projected back. And relationship is a completely different thing because the, you're loving someone and that person can love you back and that's God's will. So to feel loved is mean to feel close to other people. And in the Bible, there are two main important commandments and that is one is uh, love God and the other one is love your neighbor. And love your neighbor is more important than love God because by loving other people, we feel the unity, we feel the closeness to God. And through that, we understand the connection between everything. So loving our neighbor is actually loving God because our neighbor, our, the other person is, also God is running through that other person and he or she is a part of us. So relationships in general at their best are a way to help us heal, help us evolve. And the reason that so much of us seek therapy these days is because something in the relationship doesn't work. A friendship at its best is kind of psychotherapy. Okay, two, what's holding you back? Now, if we realize that love is just so amazing and it lifts us up and that's where we belong, why don't we feel the love all the time? What's blocking us? The thing is that we have something inside of us that's holding us back.
And I'm not talking only about romantic love, it's also with your career or with uh, other relationships. Something in you is holding you back from experiencing the love all the time. Let's take a step back. When we were kids, we used to live with open hearts. We used to live in a world full of enchantment. You know, little kids are like, oh, they love everything. They walk around, they're so happy, they're so loving, they give everybody hugs. But at a certain age, something in that enchantment like faded. And that happened when we realized that we need to do something in order to get the love. So we needed to be a good girl, to get good grades. And when we realized that that's what we need to do, our love became conditional. So it's also in ourselves. Like if we did something, we get to experience the love from ourselves too. And that's a projection saying that what you are is not enough. So the answer in this case in all matters of love is to ask God for help, to invite a power that's bigger than us to help us see situations differently. So oftentimes the ego plants negative thoughts in our mind that drive us away from people and create fear in us. So that's the factor that you know, doesn't create the unity, all sorts of imaginary judgmental things. Like the ego just wants us to be alone and honestly stuck. So when we kind of debate too much and are too afraid to take the first step, that's also the devil's work inside of ourselves um, to tell us, oh, you need to get a degree, you need to get to be an enlightened master. And all these delays are delaying us from experiencing love. So the key is to give yourself permission now to live in the present. And another small tip, if you're in a situation that you're flooded with emotions, and ask God for help is use the three day method. Like the take three days from a situation that angered you or that you were frustrated about or felt judgmental, just let that sit, don't overreact. So the ego makes us overreacting and very, very negative in a loop of negativity. All right, number three, relaxing. Why is relaxing a key to love? I love this topic. It's so important. Oftentimes the key is to give up control. So let me ask you a question. What if you could truly believe that you could afford to relax? You know, the physical body works without our interference. We don't need to make it work. We don't need to make the blood run. We don't need to make the heart beat, our lungs breathe. Everything works perfectly without our interference. And guess what? God is in charge of that. So the idea is also in your life not to interfere too much, to surrender. Relaxing is to surrender, to give up attachments to results, always doing your best, always doing it with an open heart, but not trying to control what's happening on the outside. So your job is to focus on what's happening in you, what's happening in the thought process, your judgment, your anger, or your love and appreciation. So the, the key is to notice negativity and to turn on the light bulb. So giving up control is hard. I know it's hard because we want things to look a certain way and it's especially hard with things that matter to us most. So there's a quote by Marion Williamson. She writes, instead of, dear God, please let me fall in love or please let me have this job. We say, dear God, my desire, my priority is inner peace. I want the experience of love. I don't know what would bring that to me. I leave the results of this situation in your hands. Okay, so like I said, when things matter to us most, that's when it gets hard. When we have an idea in our mind and try to force things to go a certain way, that's where the lesson is. Some of us would find it easier to give up control in, let's say, romantic relationships, but it, when it comes to career or career goals, no way that we're gonna give up attachment. We want things to look a certain way. So everything we truly care about, we think, we better handle it ourselves. But relaxing is realizing that love is the most important thing. And by focus on love, other things come into place. We don't know what will happen tomorrow or in five years from now. Our future is determined by God. And I think that everybody would agree that so many unpredicted things happen in his or her life. The only real task is to live with open hearts today 
and avoid self-initiated plans. Relaxing means to focus on love and it's it sounds maybe too simple but it's actually the most challenging thing to do. In the book there is a story about a woman that lost a lot of weight and managed to keep the weight off and when she was asked how she did it she said she had a conversation with God where she said if you want me to be fat fine but please make me feel comfortable with it. So she just wanted out of the hell of being uncomfortable with her situation and in addition to her prayer, she decided to consciously focus on the love in her relationships. And by doing that, her problems started to disappear. She realized that her body weight was a wall between her and her environment. And she built it because of her fear of closeness. So basically when she decided to become close to other people, to express herself, to listen, to give and receive love, the weight just fell off. Another aspect of relaxing is to stop trying to be something that we are not. We can't fake authenticity. We think we need to change our personalities or be like somebody else. We try to be special rather than real. And God wants us to be real. I mean, we were created so unique, each one of us. Even to want to be like others is just wanting to conform just like everybody else trying to do the same. But that's not good. And Marianne talks about that grandiosity is a cover for despair. Remember that your main role is to achieve a state in which only love and caring fills your mind, not trying to be something that you are not. And by going to what you love, you are revealing your authenticity to the world. Okay, so topic number four is how to shift perceptions. Shifting perceptions is the most important key in a loving mindset. It's all about what's happening in the mind. When we realize that it's all about what's happening in the mind and what's happening here materializes in the body, then the number one priority is to learn how to deal with our negative thoughts. So this topic might seem a little abstract to some of you, but once you understand it, once you nailed it, it will change your life to realize that the, your concern is your thoughts. So your negative mind is driven by the ego and the ego is keeping you thinking that you are right and it wants you to be alone and it leads you to destructive behaviors. The negative mind actually separates you from others. So those thoughts are often judgment, greed, selfishness, and small mindedness. It's like the ego convinces you or the de devil convinces you that you are better than someone else and you're in the loop of why somebody is wrong. The problem is, is I mean, if it would serve a good progress, then yeah, great. But the problem is that it makes you feel stuck and alone. So shifting perception is actually training the mind to focus on loving thoughts. Let's use a visual for this. Let's use a visual of imagining a dark room. So let's say you're in a totally black room, a dark room. You can't um, get rid of the darkness by hitting it with a bat. You can only get rid of the darkness by turning on the light and the same goes with the mind. Sometimes it's really, really hard to think about loving thoughts when you're so angry. And I mean, the best thing would be, okay, let's switch to the love vibration and think about loving thoughts. But in the case that you're in such a negative loop, that's where you can ask God for a solution or a force that's greater than yourself. And that force can do to you what you can't do for yourself. Don't wait till things get really bad. Sometimes you see people starting to pray to God only like when they're about to die in the hospital and things like that. But you can start it like much sooner when you realize that you're in a really, really negative loop. And then you say, God, please help me heal my mind. It's that simple with an intention that God will help heal your mind. Now, a word about quantum physics. Quantum physics reveals that as our perception of an object changes, the object itself literally changes. So one of the most important roles about changing perceptions is the law of forgiveness. I mean, this is a really important law. Bob Proctor also talks about the law of forgiveness. And 
when you nail it, not only in your relationships, it can also help you get more money. Because the problem is when you don't forgive, you hold a, an angry thought about something or someone in your mind. And that thought is very, very stubborn and it sticks and it blocks the flow of abundance through you. So the law of forgiveness is knowing how to release that judgmental thought by remembering only the loving and caring thoughts you gave the other person and the other person gave you and you have to completely forget everything else. Forgiveness is forgetting and focusing on the positive. Okay, let's take an example of forgiveness and how to invite God in your life and maybe it will be um, easier. So let's say your husband or wife left you for another person. You can't ask God to change the situation or to change him or her, but you can ask God to help you change your perception. Your ego might whisper to you and say that you will never be at peace until that person comes back to you. But that just keeps you in a state that whatever happens outside of you determines your internal place. And that's not the right place. So you want to ask God to help you gain peace. And peace comes from the right mindset. Growth is never focusing on another person's lessons, but our own. A good sentence to work with is, I'm angry, but I'm willing to see things differently. So a shift in perception is also to realize that every relationship and every lesson in our lives is not accidental. God puts people together who have the maximum potential of mutual growth. Now I want to quickly inform you of three levels of relationships just to give you an idea of how it works. So the first one is casual encounters like if you're with another person you think it's random in an elevator or if you, you're walking when we were children when you were walking with someone from school to home. So that's uh, casual. The second relationship is where two people enter a relationship that is relatively an intense teaching. It's a teaching learning situation and then they separate or appear to separate because we never truly separate. We're all always connected. The third level is a bond that once forms lasts all our lives. So each person is given a partner that presents the ultimate stage of learning. And in all of those three types of relationships that I mentioned, training the mind is important because sometimes even in a casual encounter, there are thoughts. So I want to give you also a picture to work with about this negative mind. Let's say a child presents a cut to his mother. So the mother doesn't say to him bad cut, but rather she kisses the finger, she showers it with love, and in an unconscious way, she activates the healing process. And that is what you should do. So there's a lot of talk these days about allowing our feelings, right? We hear it a lot. And most of the time, it means to feel the negative emotions, you know, to encourage you to feel the anger and stuff like that. But let's think outside the box. Maybe we need to feel or be encouraged to feel our positive emotions too, feel our joy, feel our happiness. Remember that whatever you focus on, you're going to get more of and that God's will is that we be happy now and that we see the beauty in life and the beauty in every situation and all the reasons that we have to celebrate. So encourage yourself to also feel the joy. Okay, um, number five is how to honestly communicate. This is a big one <laughs> because it's not very easy. It's actually where the work starts happening. So, so far we were talking about processes inside of us, communication is with other people. And sometimes we feel it's unspiritual of us to share our honest feelings. However, when we hold powerful information, the other person doesn't know what's going on. And a real relationship is real communication too. A real relationship is where you're totally authentic with someone. And sometimes that can be really frightening, right? Because we are afraid that if we honestly communicate with someone, maybe the other person will leave us. And that's often 
why we don't open up and that's actually blocking the relationship and blocking the love because there are important topics that needs to be discussed um a lot of people i, I do that sometimes too i might I must be honest that when you're angry you turn it inward and if, instead of knowing how to express it with the other person it's like shutting up and blocking it and then it's like self-destruction or cancer or whatever it is so you have to accept your anger and not deny it but there is a way to sharing. So instead of saying, you made me feel blank, you say, this is how I'm feeling. I'm not saying you made me feel this way. I'm sharing it as a part of my healing to move beyond it. And when your intention is to heal and work something with your partner, that's what's gonna be felt too. It's not about what we say, but the attitude that's behind what we say. There are two uh, attitudes. One is to join and one is to separate. And the person we're speaking with feels our intention regardless of our words. And sometimes it's a telepathical connection too. So also in your mind, if you choose to join and heal or if you choose to separate. The fear of communicating authentically can leave you having blockages in love. And when you don't communicate in the purpose of closeness and healing, you can easily find yourself attacking the other person and your attack will eventually make him or her feel exactly what you are feeling. So even if that person um, didn't feel bad before your attack, you'll make sure he's gonna feel bad after the attack. The ego will try to keep you not communicating, okay? So the ego or the devil doesn't want you to communicate authentically. It will try to put all the focus on the other person, why him or her is wrong. The ego would prefer you to never look directly at the pain. It would prefer a mild river of misery running through the background of your life but realize this, when the pain is there, you have an opportunity to look at it, to ask heaven for help. But it, it takes a lot of effort to grow out of a painful path. It's sometimes easier to do what we know how to do. Um, it's, it's something completely new and maybe very uncomfortable, but one of the most amazing thing about us being human is our ability to change. And when we are brave enough to communicate to see our pain, to look at it and to say, hey, what's going on in me, not with the other person, and to try to work on that, that's where the joining comes together. That's when the healing comes together. So our relationship is about joining of the minds. The body itself is nothing. It can't forgive, it can't see, it can't communicate. So every relationship is a new chance to join and heal. And the communication of the mind is the most important thing. And of course, in that lies acceptance. So it's also accepting yourself and accepting the other person. We, you know, you know already, you prefer people, they don't tell you what's wrong with you. When they say that, they actually paralyze you with shame and guilt. But when people accept you and help you feel good about yourself, they're giving you a chance to relax and find your way. The focus always must remain on yourself, not trying to fix the other person. Okay, number six is a little lighter. It's about how to attract miracles. It's a very fun topic and it's a bonus of being in a loving mindset. So. Miracles are connected to this invisible force that come from you when you're in a state of love. It doesn't mean that miracles are only for people who are loving and don't happen to people who are depressed, but it's easier to attract a miracle when you actually do the work of being loving and try to find solutions so God helps the ones that want to help themselves. But the first key is purification. And this purification is to also heal the body and mind, keeping your body pure and healthy and keeping the mind pure and healthy. So we know how to do that in the body, but and this is not the video for that, but I'm talking about how to purify the mind. That is happening with studying, examining, praying, meditating. So prayer and meditation 
help you build your mental muscles. They help you be patient and build focus. It's similar to going to the gym. You know, when you go for a workout to build your physical muscles, uh, this gym is meant to create a healthy mind and a conscious contact. And like a real gym for fitness, you need to be persistent because the, the work is gradual and it builds slowly. There is a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous that says, every problem carries its solution. So learning to attract miracles is also learning to attract solutions. There is no point in asking for another relationship or another job if we will show up the same way. We need to do our part. So God is waiting for us to ask for what you want, but also do work of purification and healing from your end. Okay, number seven and last, how to become a teacher of love. What is a teacher of love? Actually, a teacher of love is one who chooses to be one, and it's about listening to your heart and teaching others to do the same. Everybody is called to listen to their hearts, but not everyone listens. Not enough people are listening to the still voice inside them. They're constantly concerned with, have I achieved enough? Have I written the greatest screenplay, formed the most powerful company? But the world will not be saved by the most amazing business or book. It will be saved by great people. And that's what we all need. I mean, to be honest, if you have great people and loving people around you and in your life, or even encounter a great person and day, that's what lights you up. So being a teacher of love means to allow yourself to shine. And by doing that, you give other permissions to do the same. Marion writes, I used to feel like I was waiting for someone to discover me, produce me. Ultimately, I realized that the person I was waiting for was myself. The point is not to wait. As you open your heart more, you move in the direction in which you are supposed to go. Some people want to know how money and love work, right? We all want money. We all want to be in a business that we love. And you have to first understand that your money is God's money and that your job is to share your gifts. It's the best way to thank God. Think of him. He granted you gifts and your best gratitude is to share them. Make your work an expression of what you love, what you care about, what's deep in your opinion, what matters to you. And in that way, money will be attracted to you because you're hitting the nail on the head because you're doing what you love. There's a story in the book about Captain Zodiac. It's a guy who lives in Hawaii and has a lot of knowledge and love for the island's coastlines. Somebody once told him, you know a lot about this coastline and history. A lot of people would love to see what you see here and know what you know. Why don't you take people on a boat and give them a tour? So that's how his business started. He formed a successful business around his love. And this is a great example for why love is a good business. Sometimes people who weren't even interested in the coastlines would take his trip just to feel the love. So being a teacher of love means opening your heart to everyone and everything, as painful as it might be. And I know some of us were being hurt in the past, but the love still speaks and still wants to express itself. For years, you may have worked for power, money, and prestige. Now you're learning that those are values of a dying world. If you want to paint, don't wait for a grant or for somebody to give you permission. You can do it even like on a doll wall in your city and you know, just do it. You never know who's going to see it. If you genuinely have something to say, there is someone who genuinely needs to hear it. Serving three people is as important as serving 300. Once you're clear with how to deal with a small following, a large following will come. Okay, so this pretty much wraps this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this material. 
And I would like uh, to end this session with a prayer that Marianne writes at the end of her book. Um, you can close your eyes if you want. <laughs> I give this day to you, the fruit of my labor and the desires of my heart. In your hands, I place all questions. On your shoulders, I place all burdens. I pray for my brother and for myself. May we return to love. May our minds be healed. May we all be blessed. May we find our way home from pain to peace, from fear to love, from hell to heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Bye.